good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be starting momentarily in about 30 seconds. We're just going to wait for uh, hundreds of people to uh, come in from the waiting room. So uh, bear with us for just one moment. I don't want to start. I don't want to don't want to start uh, with anyone in the waiting room. So we'll give it another uh, 30 seconds or so. Uh, for those that are already in, um, no obligation, no pressure. But uh, for those who feel comfortable doing so, uh, let us know in the chat. Uh, where you're joining us from tonight. So feel free to type in your uh, your location, your your city or town, uh, where you're watching us from tonight. Let uh, Hank and uh, Susan know where all their fans are tonight. Oh, look at that. That's so oh, wow. Funny. See that? That's amazing. Okay, we'll give it another uh, 10 seconds or so, and then we'll uh, we'll get moving here. Oh, wow, somebody from Canada. Somebody just said hi, Hank, and it went by so fast. Yeah, that's that's. Gene that's Bracken, hi, Gene. <laughs> this is um so much fun. All right. Well, why don't we get to the uh, good stuff here? So, um, uh, good evening, and thanks for being with us for the next hour. Uh, Best-selling author Susan Mallory is here to discuss her latest book, *The Vineyard at Painted Moon*, uh, and she'll be in conversation with another best-selling author, Hank Philippi Ryan in this Zoom webinar. My name is Robert Hayes. I'm the Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services at the Tewksbury Public Library. And before I disappear for the night, I wanted to make a few quick uh, announcements. First, I'd like to thank everyone behind the scenes for making this event possible. This is a collaboration between several North of Boston libraries, including Andover, Billerica, Boxford, Burlington, Chumpsford, Dracut, Groveland, Haverhill, Littleton, Middleton, North Reading, Salisbury, Tewksbury, Westford, and Wilmington. My goodness. Uh, also, uh, we want to thank Wellesley Books for being our bookstore partner, and we also want to thank Harper Collins. Uh, second, uh, just know that this event is uh, going to be uh, live streamed on my library's Facebook page in about 60 seconds. Uh, feel free to give it a like and feel free to share this video. Um, third, uh, you'll also be, re be receiving a feedback survey from me tomorrow morning. Uh, please let us know what you thought of tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events. Um, also in the feedback survey will be a link to purchase an autographed copy of Susan's latest book. Uh, mm -hmm. As I mentioned, The Vineyard and Painted Moon uh, from Wellesley Books. And a reminder, 10% of each sale will benefit the participating libraries tonight. And uh, in that email, I'll also provide information on how you can purchase a copy of Hank's latest book, uh, First to Lie. And uh, finally, just to set expectations, I anticipate this event lasting approximately an hour. Uh, Susan and Hank will have a discussion. Hank will essentially interview Susan for 30, 40, 45 minutes or so, and then we'll take questions from the audience. And uh, audience members should type their questions into the Q&A box. Uh, so comments can go in the comments box and questions will go into the Q&A box. All right, so uh, absolute pleasure tonight uh, for me to introduce Hank, and uh, then I'll introduce Susan. Uh, Hank Philip Ryan is the USA Today bestselling author of 12 novels of suspense. She has won multiple prestigious awards for her crime fiction, including five Agathas, four Anthonys, and the coveted Mary Higgins Clark Award. She's also the on-air investigative reporter for Bo Boston's WHDH-TV, and she's won, are you ready for this? 37 Emmys, wow. 14 Edward R. Murrow Awards, and dozens of other honors for her groundbreaking journalism. Uh, National Book Reviews have called Hank a master at crafting suspenseful mysteries and a superb and gifted storyteller. Hank's novels have been named Best Thrillers of the Year by Library Journal, New York Post, BookBub, Pop Sugar, Real Simple Magazine, and many others. And uh, her 2019 book was the acclaimed legal thriller, The Murder List, which won the Anthony Award for Best Novel of the Year. And it was also nominated for several other awards, including the Mary Higgins Clark Award. And her newest book, as I mentioned, The First to Lie, is a chilling psychological standalone. It garnered a starred review from Publishers Weekly. And uh, again, she just can't, just can't Stop doing this. Uh, her book was nominated for the iconic Mary Higgins Clark Award. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Hank, for being with us uh, here tonight. 
And uh, now let me introduce Susan. And really, Susan needs no introduction. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, <laughs> number one, New York Times bestselling author Susan Mallory writes heartwarming, humorous novels about the relationships that define our lives, family, friendship, and romance. She's known for putting nuanced characters in emotional situations that surprise readers to laughter. Beloved by millions, her books have been translated into 28 languages. Susan lives in Washington with her husband, her two cats, which I just met, and a small poodle with delusions of grandeur. All right, so let's give a big virtual round of applause to Susan and Hank. And Hank, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Robert. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's so marvelous to see you all. And Susan, you just have to let me gush for one second. Because <laughs> okay, <I> sir. <sure>, yes. <laughs> I'm such a big fan. And when Robert asked me to interview you tonight, he said, would that be okay? And I'm like, get out of the way. I'm sitting at my chair right now to do this. So thank you so much for so many hours of wonderful reading. Um, you are completely a treasure. How are you anyway in the pandemic? How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Um, <clears throat> it's sort of sunny here so everyone should like pause and note the light on the back of the wall. It'll be gone soon because I'm in the Seattle area. You know sun is rare so um, I'm doing well. I'm actually doing well. I had a bad couple of months as I, we all have. The pandemic's been really complicated but we seem to be inching forward to a happier place so that's exciting it is it is i mean it's funny what i know when the pandemic started i had some weeks maybe of thinking why am i doing this what's the point of this why do we need to do this and i really thought finally you know i'm a storyteller people need stories people need escape it's always safe inside a book and so i sort of went back to it with renewed you know agency and intent did, you, did that happen to you at all or how how did you deal with it um, I was sort of caught up in the humor of everybody learning to work at home because I've been doing this since college. So this is kind of the only world I know. And I can remember casually saying, you know, I don't shower every day and people were so judgy. I mean, they were so judgy. And now it's like, oh yeah, I don't shower every day. I mean, if I can remember when I last showered and I plan to shower tomorrow, I'm fine. So I feel the world has joined me in the, you really don't, Although I will say Mr. Mallory is a stickler for showering every day. It's like how I wake up. Um, so uh, yeah, that's been, um, I think the need to, to provide escape is, uh, is significant. The, what I remember is actually 9-11, I was still writing then. And, um, and that was when I went through my existential, there's no point to this. And then it's like, no, this, this is the point. It is people always need a place to go. Um, somebody out there, and I don't mean this in a self grand as you know, I, I somebody out there is going to need the book I'm writing at some point, and I have no control over what or when. All I know is it is important for me to do my job every day, do it to the best of my ability to have that book out there. So if something happens and somebody needs it, it's there to take them away from whatever they're dealing with in their regular life. Um, because you're right, books are very safe. It's a very safe place to go. And it's funny because you be swept, no, I was just and be swept away. Sure. Or terrified in your case, in the your books, you know. Not like terrified, but worried. Okay, a little nervous. I mean, it, it, it is funny because in a book, and especially in your books, um, you can see that you're not alone. You can be someone else for a little while. You can work on somebody else's problems for a little while. You know, you can um you can make decisions that aren't for you and you can right. learn something about all of our lives and all of our connections. It's just one of the things that's so special about your books. And I got to tell you, if you saw that I have on the same sweatpants that I've been wearing for like, I don't know, months. Up here is fine. <laughs> like, I'm going well, up. it's impressive. They still fit because many of us have like fluctuated over the pandemic. Um, I, I was trying to be really good, but now I'm back into Cheetos. So it's just a nightmare. In fact, I'm like, make sure you got all the Cheeto powder off your hands in case you gave them. Um, the, orange is, the orange is the dead. The orange is really, it's an amazing dye. And um, I don't know what it is. I'm sure I don't want to know. And it, it's got to be doing horrible things to my intestinal tract. But oh my God, they're like the You know, if it makes food. you happy and if it keeps you writing books, 
that, you know, that's the key that we're all caring about here. And I want you all to know that if I look over here, this is, this means I'm looking at the comments. So it's not like I'm looking at my watch, but I want you to, I want you to know, Susan, that Sue is saying your books helped me make it through the three month shutdown. And so oh, nice. there you have it. that's, no, I, I think they're great. I read to escape as well. And, um, one of the things I love is, you know, in a book, it's so easy to be judgy and nobody cares if you are. It's like, oh, this could not be more stupid, this decision this character is making. And there's a glee in that that I really enjoy, you know, watching them learn and grow. And, um, you know, then what would I do in that decision, in that situation? Would I make the same decision? Am I that brave? Am I more brave? That sort of thing smarter or wiser or you know more vulnerable or less vulnerable but i want to kind of i mean it's interesting that you got to this point um in your thought process because did you did you you didn't always want to be a writer did you i mean you were a reader i've always been a reader when i was little no i never thought to, i could be a writer and i love to read um i don't remember not reading reading was a huge part of my childhood i um lived in places where there weren't a lot of kids around. And um, and like you, I my parents divorced when I was relatively young. And um, so I, my friends were in books um, and that was always a great thing, but no, it never occurred to me, you know, writers were almost mythical creatures who mm -hmm. mostly didn't live. I grew up in Burbank, California and they didn't live in Burbank. They lived in, you know, France or, or someplace. Yeah, exactly. And so it just didn't cross my mind. So I actually went to college to study accounting. Um, it's not like it was my great passion. It was just practical. I was good at math, but I wasn't good enough to be a math major. Um, and uh, so I thought that's a job, not, of course, the computer thing was just like, you know, tiny. Um, so there was not a whole lot. So it never occurred to me that career would go away or become less like being a bookkeeper or something. Anyway, so I, yeah, I was studying accounting when I was in college. So I had no, I took English one and English two because they, you had to take them, but everything else I took was a business class. And I do actually have a degree in business, which is really frightening to think about um, because I've lost that all. And I can't even imagine if I had to go into a business situation. Let's well, you're right. Well, I mean, it's interesting though, because an accounting brain is organized and there's a process, it is organized, yeah. there's a way that you do it and you analyze. And so it's not so crazy. Although, you know, if I have to do math, I'm like, is it the big number into the little number or the little number into the big number? I don't know. Um, but did you read while you were in school, while you were oh, yeah. accounting? Oh, what, yeah. What because kind of stuff did you if, read? If you're going to read, I've always loved romance. I discovered romance. Um, when I was in junior high, I read the entire library in like the first year and a half. Um, and there were these young adult books and those were my favorite. And I remember reading, and they always had tragic endings back then. It wasn't like now. And I was reading this book and I cannot remember anything about it except she was a diplomat's daughter and they were in Rio and walking on the beach and she had to go home and they were in love. And I started crying and I'm reading in my math class. And I start crying in class and the teacher asked me to stay because he was a good guy. And he's like, I need what's going on. And I really liked him. I liked, I was a good student. I liked all my teachers and I didn't want to disappoint him and tell him I had been reading in class because I felt that would crush him. So I thought, oh, something, something. It's like, oh, my parents are getting a divorce, which I was actually fine with. But, he, and so then I had to stay and talk to him for a half hour about how I was going to be okay. It's like, I don't care why. They used to fight all the time. Now they're not going to fight. It's great. I'm so not you were worried. just making this up? No, they really were getting okay, a divorce. So you, you decided just, to give him a personal thing. I just felt that was all I could come up with and not hurt his feelings because I didn't want to hurt his feelings that I'd been reading in class. You're so nice. <laughs> no, because I didn't stop reading in class. I was just careful not to read the sad ending in class. So plus, yeah, I was always a reader and I just, yeah, I read all through college I, and I, it was always romance. Romance, once I discovered romance, I was, yeah, I was sold. That was it. I was all in. What was it about? What was it about romance? I think I like the connection. I like the, um, I like the boy girl thing. 
because you know this is 16 18 you like the boy girl thing and um i liked there were a lot of historicals back then i love the historicals i love you know learning about all this stuff and then i would go because i'm just such a geek i would then go um check out a bunch of history books and read about the history and then go read the romances and yeah they were always my thing i used to subscribe to the category series and um i would just have like every month i would get 16 or 20 books showing up plus the books i got from the library plus 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 yeah it was it was um it was fun Sharon Person is saying, if you're a geek, I guess I am too. So, you know, welcome. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. So it's a different kind of geek. But yeah. yeah, it was just, I did. I always enjoyed the idea of being swept away, but it never occurred to me that I just felt so normal. And I just felt to be that creative, you had to be a unicorn. And I just sort of felt like, you know, casually normal. I've since found out that's not true. That uh, Casually I'm very... sounds like a good book title. <laughs> yeah. when, did you, when did you start? When did you have the idea of, oh, maybe I want to write a book? I actually did not. I, um, I married very, very young, very foolishly married young. And um, I was going to school and I was married and I was trying to do the adult thing and it was hard. And I got a Thing in the mail offering a local adult education center it had aerobics it had cake decorating it had dog training and it had how to write a romance novel and it i'm like i'm doing a thousand things i just want to learn how to not burn meatloaf if i could not burn meatloaf my life will be complete and i um eight weeks later the brochure came back and eight weeks after that and i thought this woman is not going to teach this class forever so I signed up and it was horrible because I was, um, I still remember it was in January. The class started in January and part of the accounting training is you have to, you volunteer for VISTA, which is income tax assistance, mm -hmm. volunteer income tax. Anyway, so two nights a week, I would do people's taxes, which I look back now and think, what were they thinking? I, I, I didn't know anything, but. I could help people who didn't speak English and really didn't understand the whole tax thing. So I was doing that. I was again with the meatloaf and um, carrying a full load and maintaining a high GPA. And then I thought, okay, I'm starting this class in January. I'm going to start a book. And so I sat down and I knew nothing, which is the best time to write when you very first start and you know nothing because it's super easy because you write as fast as you can type. And my mother had said in high school, this, this computer thing, I think it's going to take. And she made me take a typing class so that I could work a computer. And I was so, we fought about it. And, but thank God. Um, so I could type and I had a very primitive, I think it was like, I don't know, some primitive computer. And um, I just started typing and I just started, I wrote 10 pages because that's how much time I had. And that was it. I went to the class and it was magical. She was like the instructor looked regular, like there was no glow, there was no secret antlers. She was just a normal human being who had sold, and she had sold back then to Harlequin Temptation, and she had sold six books. And in the course of the class, she sold for seven. And I remember sitting there when she told us, and we're all applauding, and I started crying. And I remember thinking, if I could sell seven books that's like all the books in the world and i would never want for anything i would just be happy for the rest of my life if i could ever do that and and that was it that was and so by week six of this eight-week class i thought oh my god this is what i want to do and i'm 18 months from graduating um and so i did both i did college and i started studying writing and writing and writing as much and I would do a schedule so I would always put a calendar on my wall for finals so I would have to know how many hours to study for each class and I had a cutoff day when I had to stop writing so that I could do finals and um, it was such an advantage to be in Los Angeles because there's so much there's so many classes you can take the screen actor skill has classes tell me about the book so did it was I mean you're so organized that I'm in awe 
it's yeah. interesting that you were so organized back then that you knew that you, in order to get everything done, I mean, this is your accountant brain. You have to schedule this, 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 and this. I and scheduled everything, yeah. Yourself. But so how was that first book? Oh, it was trash. It's been shredded. It was awful. It was so incredibly bad, but I, I didn't care. I was learning and I would take, I UCLA extension has a whole writing program and I took um, description classes from poetry writers and psychology, uh, psych, uh, character psycho psychology from actual psychiatrists oh. who wanted to be writers, but couldn't. So they taught at UCLA extension. I took tons of screenwriting classes. My, the way I plot a book is based on a three act screenplay because it makes sense to me and it makes my left brain happy. And then my right blank brain can go play. So yeah, I just did both. And then I got a job with an accounting firm with Deloitte and um, they were going to pay me $27,000 a year, which was like all the money in the world sure. plus a savings account. And um, I was in the, account, the CPA review course which they had given me a scholarship for because that's how much they loved me. And um, I walked out the night we studied accounting theory and um, any CPAs, you know what I'm talking. It's not enough. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know why. And it's like, I don't want to know why. Um, and I went home and told the man I was married to at the time. And I said, I don't want to do this. I want to be a romance writer. And it was like, we were going to eat meat. We were going to have access to more than one meatloaf a week that you burn. Um, so it was a very hard negotiation because I was going to, I wanted to turn down this amazing job. And so we did, we finally agreed I would have two years to sell. And then I had to go get a real job. And that was it. I graduated in May. I sold my first book in August. And by the time the two years were up, I think I'd sold um, seven or eight books. And remember, it, how, remember how you were talking about how selling seven books would be all you could ever want to do. And then it was nothing. It, it was, was like nothing. more. <laughs> well, that's so interesting because I was wondering what was it that you understood about yourself at that time that this sort of writing flower bloomed and bloomed and bloomed and bloomed. And, and you must have gotten better at it. And not that it's ever easier, but you must have gotten more. You understood it more as you did it. Um, I had never felt that way about anything before I had, I don't think everyone is blessed to have a passion. I, mm -hmm. I think it would be great, but most people I think do the job they do and they like a lot of it and they don't like parts of it because there's parts of every job that is not fun, but the ability to find, to, to me, stumble upon my passion. I just knew, I knew, I knew I could do it. I knew I could work harder. Um, I do not under any circumstances consider myself the most talented person. I don't, I think I have an average amount of talent, but what I do have is drive and the determination to make every book better mm -hmm. and a willingness to do the work. And so I think the willingness to do the work and the goal of always doing better is more significant than talent. And I say that, as I said, as not, you know, I'm not, an incredible, I think I'm a good writer, but I'm, there are people who are so incredibly talented who will never sit their butt down and finish the book. Um, so the world will never know. And worse, the world will never get to read that amazing book because it will never be written. And that was never my thing. It's like, I, especially in those early years, I was working 14 hours a day, seven days a week, I was studying, I was in two critique groups, I was putting out pages, I was going to every conference I could, I was selling magazine articles and short, or, short stories to pay for the conferences I wanted to go like to. It? What do you like at the computer typewriter, whatever you were using at the time? Were you like gloriously happy? Were you working, working, working? Were you thinking? Oh, I loved it. No, it was, there was nothing in the world better than a great writing day, which is probably one of the reasons my marriage didn't last. Um, but yeah, that is the best. I mean, the writing is my favorite. There are writers, and you know this, there's writers who want to think about it. There's writers who want to edit. It's like, just get that first draft down. And then the real fun begins when you revise. For me, the actual writing is the part I like. And That's ironically, quite amazing. Go ahead. most writers, not most, many writers don't actually like writing. That's the part they don't like. And I've never understood that because to me, the writing is 
the magic. I mean, that's where the concept and the, the promise become the reality. And can I, if the scene turns out how I see it, it's like, that's the best. That is the best. I know that feeling so well. You can't make it happen. It mm -hmm. just has to, it evolves. Like somebody was saying to me once that, that the muse only comes when you're working. Yes. You, know, you can think about it and think about it, but until you're sitting, I mean, I sit, sit right here at this desk until I'm right here in the book and I somehow the movie of the book begins to reveal itself to me in some sort of, and I don't want to say magic and I don't want to say woo, but it is in some way, our imaginations are so, you know, incomprehensible. Where, where does that all come from? And that's what I want to talk to you a little about specifically about your book. So this is going by way too fast. Um, where did the, where was the moment, let's talk about Vineyard at Painted Moon. Where was the moment that the germ of this particular book began to bloom. I knew I wanted to write a story where uh, I like people at crossroads and people having to make impossible choices mm -hmm. um, within the purview of what I do. And I wanted a woman, it's like, what are you willing to pay to get your dream? Because everything has a price. Um, it's not dollars, but it's time, it's passion, it's other opportunities that you aren't going to take advantage of. So for me, the, oh, I'm petting it because I have it here. So I'm yeah, good. petting it. Um, what I loved about this book was Mackenzie has the opportunity to pursue the things she's never allowed herself to acknowledge she wants, but the price of it is everything. And are you willing to pay everything? It's sort of like, and I always go back to this, always, this will make you laugh, The Little Mermaid. So in the Disney version of The Little Mermaid, the thing Eric felt, Prince Eric, and I've seen it way too many times that these names just casually roll off my tongue. Prince Eric, what he loves about Ariel is her voice. And the thing she has to give up to be human is the one thing he loves about her. Now we'll talk about the weirdness of all of that if you want. But my point is the price. At the beginning, if she had um, just seen him and not he'd not heard her sing and she'd given up her voice, it's just, well, here's this pretty quiet girl, what's not to love? But by the time she actually does it, he's fallen in love with the one thing she's surrendering. And I always enjoy that. What price will you pay? And characters must pay a high price in my books because I'm mean spirited and they have to earn their happy ending. So I wanted to play with what if you did have to give up everything? And then it's like, well, how does that happen? And, um, and so that's where I started with the Vineyard of Painted Moon. I always knew Mackenzie's journey was going to be she has everything. I mean, she has the job she loves. She has a family. She has this beautiful vineyard. She makes these amazing wines. She's got a mother-in-law who's like a mother to her. And then it all falls apart when she and her husband realize their marriage is over. But the price for Mackenzie is everything. It's not just she's losing Reese. She's losing, she stays and becomes an employee or she walks away and well, I know some, of these, some of the 200 people who are here tonight have read this book and some haven't so just briefly it, Mackenzie is married she's married into a, a, a family that owns a vineyard that has yes. wonderful wines which she grows to love and grows to be qu quite successful at making her own wines and sort of wins over the mother-in-law you know does a fantastic job and then as you say exactly her marriage falls apart and she realizes she's not really family and then a lot of things happen which we won't which we won't, we won't discuss any point. of those but yes um, she is a, a master winemaker and um loves what she does and has it's the most perfect situation she lives in why, a family why did you pick vineyard why did you pick it's just such a wonderful metaphor in so many ways but did it start with a real vineyard or did it start with it's, sort of growing it started vineyard? with i had the concept and so there needed to be a family business and something that she could be a part of and it could be significant and she could take with her. Um, and something I wanted to write about and something I thought would be a really great setting. Um, some of my books, I like to do one of those amazing aspirational settings where it's like, I just wanna go be there. 
Um, and what's funny is a lot of people have said, oh, this was your COVID book. This isn't my COVID book. I actually had finished this before uh, the pandemic started. The next book I have out is my COVID book. So I had already done this and was just starting revisions when we all shut down. And then it was like, I'm so glad I get to go there because I, my life is, the world is confusing and scary right now. So I get to spend a month editing in, um, in it's in Walla Walla, Washington, which is a real place. And, uh, and I get to be at the Painted Moon Winery. So um, did you know about, I mean, the, having a setting of a vineyard is so wonderful because the stakes are so high. It's so seasonal. Everybody loves wine. I brought mine tonight to salute you. Oh, you're so brave. I just do like the water. The wine is Well, I'm not drinking it for goodness sake. I'll, this is just symbolic wine. that. Okay, I'm I was going to say, I, wow. No, I uh, mine is a reward. Kind of a it's, I put it in like this when kind you of give glass it, so I wouldn't tip it over, right? Oh, that's <laughs> see, we use those glasses all the time because oh, yeah. they fit better in the dishwasher. <laughs> they don't have a stem, so they you just go that. right in the dishwasher as they should. But um, the, the vineyard setting, did you go to vineyards? Are there special ones that you visited? Did you connect with the... The, the winemakers and the people who create them and own them? Mr. Mallory and I are huge wine fans and we mm -hmm. have been to wine country and Washington state has a very large, successful, happy wine industry, um, second only to California. And it's millions and millions and millions of barrels a year. So we have been to the, what we've been to Walla Walla. We've eaten at the restaurants I mentioned. We've tasted the, except for um, Painted Moon, and the um, the Barcelona families wines, um, all the other vineyards mentioned are real. Um, we we belong to wine clubs, so this was this was an easy one for me. This was a lot of fun um, doing the research. I do have, and I should have brought it. Um, I have a actual because you can get a degree in viniculture here um, in a couple. Washington State University has one, and I have an actual textbook that I read um, so that I could get the technical part. I don't, I don't want to make anyone suffer for that. So it's not a lot in the book, but it was in my head as I wrote so that I knew, you know, this is real, this is happening. This is be where we are. But yeah, it's fun. I think, I think it was, um, I had a, I had a great time. Somebody has to do the tough research on this. I know, I know. So it's yeah, it is, it is really fun to, um, to be able to do to sink into the research when it's that fun. But that's another thing that's wonderful about your books. That the, there are a couple of levels, and I want to talk about each of them because there's the emotional level, and there's the story level, and there's sort of the um, thematic level, and then there's the the actual educational level. I mean, your readers <laughs> are smart, and they come out of this book knowing more about wine than they did when they went in, in a very seamless, easy to go down kind of way you know how when you are writing your books and not do you do them the same way people are asking are you are you were talked about a three-act structure but within the three-act structure that rising and falling action and the and the and the separateness and the seamlessness do you have an idea of where you're going who wants what and where they're going do you know what the end will be yes i believe you simply surrender to the story and the story takes you on a journey. I plot my book start to finish before I um, write a word on the actual book. Um, I know what's happening. I know the exact, not the exact, but I know I have plotted the book. The book is um, structured. I the surprises I want are the character surprises. I don't want to get to page 400 of a 600 page book and realize I can't end this. Oh. Um, so there'll be none of that in my world. And I hate revisions. I'm one of those, I want to write. If I just could write and then the books, the pages magically appeared in New York and I never had to read them again, that would be perfection for me. So I work as hard as I can to, when I turn a book in, it is as close to perfect as I can make it. Mm -hmm. um, I always do. I have never, I still dream all these years later of the phone call saying, there's a typo on page 337. Otherwise it is sheer perfection. I've said that to every editor I've had and not one of them has felt the need to make that fantasy come true, sadly. Still um, time, still time. There's still time. There is time. Um, and I'm just putting so it out into the universe saying that would be fabulous. Um, but no, I plot in great detail. Um, 
And in a book like this, so Mackenzie's our main story, but there's also Stephanie, who is Mackenzie's sister-in-law. Oh, do not rub against the halo light, sweetheart. Alan, sorry, kitty. Um, because it's into flames. It's well, it's gonna fall. Um, and uh, oh, that's nice. Let's not do that on national television, sweetheart. Um, anyway, the uh, so everybody has a story. So um, Mackenzie's story is completely plotted, and hers is the biggest story. And mm -hmm. I did her first, so I wrote a scene from her point of view, and then I plotted her entire story. I in the three act structure, and then I put it aside, and then I did Stephanie, and I developed her character and I thought about what her storyline was and then I wrote a scene in her point of view and then I plotted her entire story and then the, the third point of view character in the book is Barbara who is um, uh, Mackenzie's mother-in-law Stephanie's mother she has a storyline as well um, and same thing first scene from her point of view and her entire story structure is plotted and I'm going to lean out for a second because I have them right here and then when I plot, I end up with, and this is going to scare you a little bit because I know you're not a plotter. So this is a book I just finished. So this is how much is in this chapter, this scene. This is one character scene, and this is how much I plot. So I really don't plot. I write a tiny first draft, and it's character, it's scene by scene. And then, so this book, her name is Mickey, and it actually starts by saying Mickey at the barbecue. Um, and I set up where it is, there'll be, um, there'll be snippets. I know, I know I can feel your heart killing me. My head is just, first of and all, so all the stuff that's supposed to happen. And I, um, it's M1 cause it's Mickey. And the one is, this is the first scene because at the, I'm going to write all of Mickey scenes. And then, um, I'm going to braid the book together. I'm going to have stacks of these and then braid them. And I need to make sure everybody's plotting goes in order I can't do her scene four before I do her scene three because that won't work and then some of them are you know even longer and I have like the book I just finished and probably Mackenzie's book's about the same 76 of these and that's what a book is and so that's how I put it together so every day I sit down and this is what I'm doing and so I just make that into an actual scene and then I go to the next one. So yeah, it's totally structured. They still shock me and we have meetings um, and I have to, it's, and I don't, I'm sure this happens for you too. I will complain at dinner, you know, that I just can't believe what so-and-so did. And occasionally I get the real or fictional, is that yes. real or fictional? <laughs> but to me, if you create the character correctly, then, then they go. I mean, they go and I'm just there with them watching. I don't make them do anything. And if they don't do what I want, then something has gone wrong. Um, and I want to blame them, but it's probably me because I'm the only sentient being in the room. Um, so then I have to go back and figure out what's going wrong with the story. But yeah, I'm a very detailed plotter. It's Forgive me for ever wondering about that accounting element of your, <laughs> of your brain, because there it is in, you know, in all its amazing, shocking glory. It is a little bizarre. It's, it's not, kind well, of... I don't know if it's bizarre, but it's, it's impressive. Um, it's kind of awe-inspiring because I can see how your brain, I can't do it, but I can see how your brain would work. I can see how that would work. I can see them, I can see the math and the organization and the structure in that. How long does it, I mean, all, all of your people are going, oh my golly, oh my gosh, she's so organized. How does she do it? Um, how long does it take to do the cards and the- And the plotting? Mm -hmm. it's, about, um, it's about three weeks. It takes me about three weeks to get from, okay, I'm ready. So first I come up with an idea. And then um, I have an amazing assistant, Janelle, and she and I will brainstorm back and forth in email. And then it, it sits. And then if I decide I want to write the book, um, I have some writer friends and we, well, we used to, now we're doing it all on Zoom. We brainstorm together. And it's, um, we spend a couple of hours on each person's book. It's, it's very organized, not surprising. Um, and we record the sessions. Oh. Um, and then I come home and I transcribe the recording. And uh, sorry, cat hair. Um, I transcribe the recording and then from that I create a synopsis that I send to my editor 
and you know, then the notes come back and there's Can stories. you come over? Um, <laughs> I'm far. I'm far. We talked about this. I could get an I-90 and I would be there in seven days. Um, I so, so then we, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, so then from there, it, this, then it goes on hold until it's, it's time to be written because I, have to, you know, books are due at a certain time. So you've got to pay attention. So then when I start the book, I pull out everything. I have my notes. Um, I always joke, it's not really a book until I've written notes on a Starbucks napkin. Um, and I don't keep them. I actually am going and I'm in my car and it's like, oh my God. And I have to pull over and write a note. Um, and then I start, I, I do what I feel I need to. Sometimes some character like McKinsey, I knew I didn't have to do character charts or anything. I knew McKinsey start to finish. I knew everything about her. I understood her. And I really understood Barbara. Barbara was clear to well, me from to stop the you from right. I need to stop you right there because I don't want to give anything about away about this, but, but Barbara is one of the best characters. I mean, I love McKinsey, of course, and I feel for her and I understand, I think I understand her and I think she's brave and strong and, a, you know, a real Susan Mallory woman, which is quite wonderful. And one of the reasons we read your book so loyally, but Barbara, <laughs> whoa, and don't give anything away, but where did that person come out in your brain? Well, I will just say that I don't usually write characters like her and it was, it was fun. And I'm not going to give anything away, but I will tell you there were editorial discussions at the end when I turned the book in about changing her character arc to be less Barbara-like. Uh -huh. And I just said, no, no. Um, and it needed to, I always saw that as the ending with her. I always knew that that's what was going to happen. And Stephanie was the one I had to build. Stephanie took a couple of turns. Um, and originally Stephanie was going to get involved with a much younger man. And I actually got like two thirds of the way through that and thought, I don't love this. So mm -hmm. I started over with her and she goes on a completely different journey now. Um, and I think she's stronger because of it. And I think Mackenzie's bravery is what, in, I never say that overtly, but I think Mackenzie's bravery is what inspires her to take the steps she took. And there's just some hysterically funny stuff she deals with. I'm getting a lot of mail about the twins. For those of you who've read the book, and it's like I love them, and they scare me. They so scared me, right? Though, and they were not in my plotting. It just they went. I she was going on an interview to talk about cheese, and I had what was supposed to happen, but I didn't know who she was going to meet until I started writing. It's like oh, I am. I feel like I've stepped into a Stephen King novel. I mean, it was just they terrified me, and it's yeah, like, I'm oh like, my oh. god. I was, I, reading that part of, I was reading that part and I thought, get out of there, get, get yeah. out of there. there this, is a, this is a bad scene. This is a bad scene. And Robert has just put on the link again to get an autographed copy of this wonderful book from Wellesley Books. No pressure. It's just her career. Click on, click on that. <laughs> click on yes, that. I have expensive fluffy cats to see. Exactly. I know. Oh, they're kisses. I know. <laughs> one of the things that, one of the lines I loved in the book um, someone says to Mackenzie, and I won't say who, you don't need luck, you never have. And that's such an empowering line. It brings tears to my eyes to think about that a little bit. I know a lot of our lives is whatever luck is, the randomness of the universe and what it presents at the time and how, you know, how we deal with it and how we learn to understand that maybe something that you think is bad um, might be good if you just if you just brave your way through it or you know are true to yourself how much do you think about how your readers can get empowered if i can use that word from what your characters do um i think one of the things i try to do is write about relatively ordinary people the guys are not always ordinary bruno is certainly not um i actually don't know anyone who owns a private jet so there's that but i do try to make the women normal mm -hmm. and the extraordinary acts come from being brave being prepared doing the work um i have a strong sense of fairness in my life and um i believe the good should be rewarded and the bad should be punished and life doesn't work like that but 
it does in my books. My characters have to earn their happy ending. And if they're horrible people, they will be punished. Um, I will say that if you are a, somebody who I see you being mean to someone in life, you will be a dead parent in one of my books because that is the tiny power I have. But <laughs> other than that, um, I hope that it is an escape. I hope when people read my books that, you know, I make them laugh, I make them cry, that if they're in a good relationship, they go to their partner and say, page 167, let's do that. Um, <laughs> I, I want that for them. And I want to be a soft, a safe place for them to escape from their life. And if it causes them to aspire to do something, I think that's fantastic. Um, and that's just a bonus for me. I believe my contract with my readers is to, is to take them away and to make them feel good at the end. And that's what I do in the books. I don't, I don't believe in the existential ending. I hate it. Um, I want resolution. I, I want to know. But I, I have it's, always, it's always, you know, it makes, I, it, as a reader, I can say that it always makes me feel optimistic, hopeful, you know, um, a, a little bit brave, like, like I think people should be. I mean, I love, you know, you secretly, I don't know if you did this on purpose, I'm sure you did, but the idea of the first vineyard in the book, Belle Après, which means good after, you know, or happy ending. And it's, you know, it's a, it, I took that as a message of, you know, here's a Susan Mallory book coming and we will brave this through with the characters. And, and see what happens. There's this good resolution that we hope for in our own lives. It was actually named by a reader. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I do a lot of that on Facebook. Yes, I needed a name. And um, so, yeah, I got that from a reader. It was did nice. Did he mean that or he? I'm sorry? Did, he, was the, did the reader mean that to be the, the reason for it? Why did you pick it? I picked it because it worked for the story, but I did not come up with it. I just, I asked on Facebook for names of a winery and um, so the amazing Janelle put together a grid for me so I can look at them. I picked the ones I like and then she put them in a grid and I could just, and the words that were in this case, you know, the translation was there and I just thought that is what this is about. Of course, I mean, of And course. so, yeah, it was great. It's really hard though. And you must know this from your work as well to find names of things that have not been used. You have to be so careful. And so always on, my mother-in-law would say, I was on the Google um, looking for, you know, is this a winery? Is this a prison gang? Is this, you know, is it okay to use this? It's really hard. So I named a book and I named a, a school, a private school in my upcoming book, um, a name, which I won't say. And when my husband read the book, he's always my first reader. He said, why would you name it that? I said, well, it just sounded like a prep school to me. And he said, because there is a prep school named that, and it has a terrible reputation, and you're going to get in a lot of trouble. So I thought, okay, well, never mind. I just change it. Ping, edit, find. Um, and the whole thing changed to a completely different name. Um, you're such a book club lover. How do you feel when book clubs call you? Do you do it on Zoom? Do you, how do you, or do you do it on your, on your Facebook page? How we'll do whatever they want to do whatever they want to do. It's, um, and it's always funny because I like the evening ones because I know they're drinking. And after 15 minutes, I am just at a party. Um, the library ones at 10 in the morning, Eastern time, it's like, these are serious people and they're going to ask me hard questions. It's going to be hard. Um, well, in the back of your book, you do have wine pairings. So that's all. I know. Isn't that fun? Yeah. And we're doing some on Facebook as well. Yeah. That was uh, um, the work I do. The work I do. You're so good to us. You are so good to us. Let me look at the questions a little bit and see you have so many questions. Somebody was saying, Martha says, what a great superpower, killing the bad people. I know, isn't that nice? It is, yeah. Chances are if there's a dead parent, it's like, oh, she was rude in the store. She's dead now. And Amy's saying, Barbara drove me nuts, but I agree, I love to hate her. So, and Donna says, I'm glad you left her the way she is. I hope this is tempting all of you to find this book to see what happened with Barbara. Let me look at the questions real fast, Susan. Um, and here's the first question. Did you enjoy developing Barbara? Um, the, all the questions about Barbara and research I, in the vineyards. Um, I did. Barbara was fun because if you've read me before, I don't generally do characters like that. Certainly not as a point of view character. And what I loved was the reveal because in the beginning, she's, she's great. And then we actually get a journey into her psyche. And 
um, there's a man in her life and we meet him right away. It's not a surprise. What I love about their relationship is his vision of her versus her vision of herself. And um, I think it would be, I, I'm torn about that theory. Would I want a man in my life who saw me as better than I was or would it be exhausting? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think seeing the real person is always better, but it's a fun thing to play with. I think men who, there are men who always want a princess in their life. And I think the men who have their princess are never quite clear on who the princess is. Again, <laughs> exhausting for the princess. Have you, have you like, used uh, that line in a book? That's a great line. That is No, great I, I don't believe, I, I don't possibly, but yeah. No, there, I do believe, I, there are definitely relationships where you look at them and think, oh, she's his princess. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't do that. I, if a man thought I, thought of me as his princess I would have to kill him in his sleep it would be sad but you know no I need someone who like sees me for me and not that would make me insane but I have a friend who's a princess in their relationship and it's like how do you not kill him I just don't get it, it. works it works he's so nice to you it's like weird <laughs> Susan Engel is saying putting the first word on paper uh is the challenge she says is that is that for you the or what is the chat what is the big challenge for you I can't start until I have the first line and I can't know you can't how where do you start if you don't have that and I really work hard to have the first line before I even write the synopsis so I've already got it it's in my head like um I'm starting a book in a few days and um the the first line it's funny it's a funny Christmassy thing and it's like you have very nice teeth my dear and you're quite young so I assume they're your own it's like I'm in and it just is like oh thank god now I can work and it no it will not change that will be the opening line mm -hmm. that, that'll be it so my I need lines it. always are this they when I get them that they stay that and it's yes. so interesting because people say you know the open the point of the opening line sometimes is it's the whole book but in some way the opening line is the whole book and how often do we pick up a book in a bookstore and open it to that first page and you read the first line and you think oh yeah this is going to be good how do we know that you know how do we know that and how do you as an author know that that first line will work i think for me the first line the first page is a promise um at the bottom of the first page i want as a reader and it's much harder as you know the more you write the harder it is to be a reader because we know what's happening behind the scenes yes. and so at the bottom of the first page i personally either am hunched over like a cat in the rain or i just exhale and it's like i trust you to take me on this journey um and so that is what i feel the 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 tone the the pace the characters the situation it is the promise i'm making to you that's what this book is going to be and if this is what you like, then come with me. I think you'll have a good time. Um, but I don't want to violate the promise of what, of what I'm giving the reader. I want the first page to represent, this is the book, as you said, this is what it is. And if the first line can set the tone, um, then that's even better. But it has to be, it has to be, I find dialogue works best because it's, mm -hmm. it's, I don't know, some prose, it's just hard to me unless well, you're good because you're meeting a person, they're yes. setting up something that they want. They're obviously talking to someone else, which, which means there's another character with them who you, who we don't know who is yet, but it's important enough to be said, it's important enough to be the first thing. So it's the exactly. domino that starts the book, you know, all the dominoes in the book falling, if that's how you feel about a book. I'm interested so much in what you said about the contract of the promise with your readers. How much, how much in your head or not are all the no pressure millions and millions and millions and millions of people who are going to be reading this book and who love you and who want this to be what they want it to be, you know, sort of the same thing, but different, 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 but you, yes. with Susan DNA. And the readers are a big part for me. Um, I, I am not one of those writers who is happy to just write it for myself. I just, I don't know. I don't get that one. I write to share my story. There are times when I will write a scene and I love it and I'll send part of it to my assistant out of the blue in the middle of a book that she's not going to read for two months. 
um, cause she's my first reader huh. and, um, she, so I, I want to share it. I want to be like, Oh, come read this part. This part's going to make you laugh. You're going to love this part. Oh, you are going to be so pissed at me at this part, but you know, I'm right. So I feel them with me and I do write for my readers and I'm very, I think I'm pretty clear on their expectations. I've written a lot of books. I've been doing this a long time. I started in category romance, um, writing for what was then silhouette books. And one of the advantages of category, um, was I got to experiment with a ton of stuff. And um, I got to figure out what my readers liked, what I liked, and the Venn diagram, where we met, what was that um, diamond shape that we agreed on, or the oval of the middle of it. And I, there's stuff I'd love to write, but I will never write it with, you know, uh, well, first of all, my editor would send henchmen after me. Um, I used to have an editor years ago who used to joke with me. She wanted me to do Ebola on a submarine. No. And I, and I we would, it was just sort of our thing. And, and then there was an Ebola outbreak. And it's like, oh, okay, we're not going to joke about that anymore because it's real now because it wasn't real then. And I totally forgot myself. And I was having dinner, you know, the editor, the publisher, your agent, the, the fancy dinner where they, it's lovely, they toast you. It is a, a magical moment. And I, I was joking. I said, well, I'm thinking of doing Ebola on a submarine. The table went silent. It went silent. And it's like, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. It's like, just, a, no, sorry. So I don't really want to write that, but there are things I'd love to write. Like, I love what you do. And I, I, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I bet you could. No. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because I grew up reading fail safe in seven days in May and all the thrillers I, I, and the, and the golden age mysteries, Agatha Christie and Niall Marsh and Josephine Tay. And that sort of, that sort of puzzle, the idea that there mm -hmm. could be a mystery that someone needed to solve and that I could solve it. But, you know, exactly as you, as you said, I have no idea what's going to happen next in my books. And I do get to the point where I think I have created this mystery and now I have no idea how to solve yeah, it. Yeah, I can't solve it. No, that and, would make me insane. Well, it does um, make me insane for about a week. And then, but then the Susan Mallory brain kind of comes in and I say, what if this, what if it's this, what if it's this, what if it's this? And the people, and someone is asking you this in the Q and A as well, the people do, because they're real, they do what they would really do. And I, and I think when your characters and yours clearly do come alive, um, then the story begins to unfold. Yes, I agree. Uh, the difference is I know them before I start, whereas you learn about them as you write. And, yeah. and so I make sure they're real before I write page one. Um, I need them real. I just know I need that structure. I need to know it's all happening. Um, Sharon is asking, how do you, and this is, you probably have some massive system for this. How do you keep tr your names in your books are fabulous and unusual, but, but relatable. And, and I mean that in a, in a very complimentary way. Um, how do you keep, oh no. <laughs> and I tear because it's always here. Oh, and this one, you may not know about this one. This will change your life. Oh, it's backwards. Novel last names. It's an entire book of last names. Oh, I and what know. they mean. Oh, I know. You need them. You this is like this is like writer craft. This is um, no, and they are literally here, sitting every day. And um, I do when I plot a book. I do it. I have an alphabet list because I don't know about you, but if if I'm not controlled, everyone will start with the letter N for yep. some reason I'm or sweet. R. I'm sweet. And so, um, and I'm actually playing with an idea right now. So this is what I do. So it's Tori, Morgan, Noah, Jaslyn, and Sasha is what I have thus far. And in three weeks, it, we'll know their story, right? Yeah, no, this is still at the, I, this is like a year and a half away. Um, but I was today pulling, you know, so I just was flipping through. Oh, and I'm sorry, this is the last of show and tell. No, I love it. So I have this little thing I keep because my desk is L-shaped and it gives me a secret shelf. So you know what these are. These are the, when you get it, go to a book signing. So I went to a book signing, Tori, and if I, if I keep your post-it, that's where Tori came from. And I have all these, you know, Devin and all these. So I keep them. 
And then when I'm starting a book, I'll flip through and take one or two from here. And then I go to my name book. I've got to tell you, I do that too. I take the stickies from my signing and think, Ooh, your name is Abigail. I, I haven't, I don't have an Abigail yet. I've and never the, done an Abigail. Yeah. And the people, when you, I have to tell you that I look at the, I look at the credits on movies uh, and on TV and I, and I put, take one first name and one last name and see if that works or switch them the other way around. And the character um, emerges, that character can only, that name can only be one kind of a person. And, yes. and yeah. when you get the wrong, when you give a person the wrong name, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. We are tick, tick, ticking out of time. Let me ask oh, you one. Are. La let me ask you one fast last question and I'm going back to your class when you started learning how to write and you said oh if I only had seven books and now here you are with what 50 billion books how many do you even yeah, know yeah it's about 170 I think 170 books. I know I mean what do you does that bring tears to your eyes to think this journey that you've been on and here are hundreds of people um loving your books and waiting for the next one what do you think about that i think i have like fifteen thousand ideas and i need to write faster it's always i'm always chasing the next one it's always a the best book is the book that i'm just not written yet i mean the to get the great idea and to be like oh that that because not every idea is book worthy so I, um, I don't really think about it. I don't, the only way it comes up is this, I've used the name before, I've used the career before. Um, oh, I can't do that. I did that, you know, 15, 25, 35 books do, ago. Do you think, but are you happy? Are you? Oh, I'm delighted. I am blessed. I am so lucky. I get to do what I love every single day. Um, I get to make my living at this, doing what I love. I have wonderful readers who support me and are so sweet to me and help me name things. And, and when we can do signings again, they'll come hug me and I'll hug them back and it will be great. I've, I've had friendships for years with readers. And so this is glorious and I'm not sure why I got lucky. I'm grateful every single day that I get to do this because a, I no longer have training for anything else, nor the personality, but I just, I am happy writing every single day and I, I don't know what else would make me this happy. So I'm just very grateful. I am grateful all the time that I get to do this and without my readers, I couldn't. So they make this happen. Well, I want you to promise me that you'll come back to this on video and okay. look at the comments because people are applauding you. Sharon says, Susan has the best review, review crew ever. This is the be best thing. This is the first thing I've done for myself in so long. I love this. I, thank you ladies for this wonderful hour. I wish it could last longer. Thank you, Susan and Hank. You, this is for you and I applaud you and we all are eagerly waiting your next book. And let me say one more time to these hundreds of people, please look for The Vineyard at Painted Moon and Susan's books coming up. And Susan, thank you. You're, you're thank quite you. amazing. Oh, you were fantastic. Thank you for making this so easy. Wonderful to have you here tonight. Thank you to all of the library. Susan, good luck. Can't wait for your next book. Thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Please stay safe and we will see you next time. Thank you.